Okay, in this lecture series we'll be covering some basic statistics. Uh, some of you may already have experience with many of the basic concepts and terms that we cover here, especially if you already have had or are currently taking a statistics course. Of course, we use statistics every day, not just in psychological research. Um, there are polls, particularly about politics. Um, those are always driven by basic statistics. Maybe you track your exercise regime, perhaps you're a runner or a swimmer, and you want to keep track of your lap times. Um, of course, there's surveys for businesses and nonprofit groups. These are all examples of basic statistics in everyday use. So we have two types of statistics, uh, descriptive and inferential. Descriptive statistics organize data in t and uh, organize data to communicate the main features of the data set. Um, it basically describes the data to us. Inferential statistics helps us to derive meaning from that data and then draw conclusions. So we should pause at this point to talk a little about uh, numbers. Not all numbers have arithmetic meaning. Uh, for example, sports uniform numbers. Sometimes numbers denote order, like class rank or um, something like that, or race time. Um, and the measurement scale that we use determines the types of statistics that we can use in evaluation. So our measurement scales, uh, first of all we have a nominal scale. Nominal means in name only. Uh, so a driver's license number, for example, is just a number assigned randomly to each license. Um, it doesn't really mean anything. Your number will be different from mine, but that doesn't mean that you're a better driver or a worse driver than me. It's just a different one. An ordinal scale, on the other hand, denotes rank. Um, ordinal meaning order or pertaining to order. Uh, in this case, the number does indicate a relationship to the other numbers in the set. We have interval scales indicating a, rela a relationship between the numbers in the set in which the numbers are organized into consistent units with no true zero point. Um, so in an ordinal scale, such as race results, the difference between first or second may be considerably different than the difference between second and third, whereas in an interval scale, the difference between numbers is consistent. A ratio scale is the same as an interval scale, but now we have a zero point. So test scores are a good example. Right? Although it's unlikely that someone will score zero on the next unit test, um, it is a possibility, and therefore that would be a ratio scale. So in this slide we have our four measurement scales. With nominal data, um, the only measure of central tendency we, we can determine is mode. Uh, we cannot calculate mean or median. Um, really, nominal data is typically only used in qualitative research. Ordinal data can be used to calculate uh, mode and median, but not mean. Um, and remember that mean is the arithmetic average. So think of it this way. If we're looking at the rankings of international tennis players, right, that would be an ordinal scale. Um, there's no average ranking. right? You're either first or twelfth or fiftieth. Um, there's no average there. With interval data, um, we can determine mean, mode, and median. Um, because the difference between numbers is consistent, we can also determine measures of variation such as range and standard deviation. Because there's no zero point in interval data, we cannot perform some operations. Right? We can't do a coefficient of variation, for example. Um, that's not something that we're going to do in this class, but you need to know that interval scale data is limited in some ways. Ratio data um, has, a, has a zero point, and therefore um, Therefore, ratios between the numbers uh, have meaning, and we can do more with the data. Um, again, most of that stuff we're going to leave out of this class. It's not within the scope of this class. Uh, in psychology, we're typically working with interval scales, um, sort of as a function of the variables that we're measuring. Right. So um, if we are investigating intelligence, again, for example, if we want to measure intelligence, well, what's the absolute zero point of intelligence? Um, maybe, maybe Paris Hilton. So before we can really attempt to draw any conclusions from our data, we must first apply meaning to the numbers. Um, so for this, we need to organize the data using various types of frequency distributions. Um, here's an example of a group of test scores. It uh, doesn't really do much for us as it is. And this is just a group of people who scored this on the latest unit test. doesn't really tell us much information at the moment. So we have to organize it into a frequency distribution. Notice that we note each possible score and the frequency of occurrences of that score. 
So in this example, even though we didn't get a score of 86, we still have to note that in our distribution. We did get a score of 91. In fact, we got three scores of 91, so we have to note how many of those scores we received. Uh, in this case, uh, we had 15 scores total as shown by you know, n equals 15. n represents the total number of scores. We can also show the frequency distribution of grouped scores. And this is a good way to show how scores tend to cluster together. Uh, we can group the scores however we see fit, so long as the intervals in the groups are equal and there is no overlap between the groups. So in this case, we grouped them into groups of four, and we showed how many scores occurred in each group. And again, our number of scores is 15. Once we have organized our data, uh, we can do all kinds of fun things like visual representations or graphs. Uh, there are many types of graphs, graphs, and if you've ever used Microsoft Excel, you know that you can take your data and you can plug it into just about any graphic re representation. Uh, but just because you can doesn't really mean you should. Uh, students and even professional researchers and reports uh, frequently misuse graphs. Um, and here's an example of such. So we really shouldn't be using a pie chart to represent relative temperatures in different parts uh, of the country. So th this would be a bad example of using a pie chart. Again, th uh, really, we can't use a pie chart. Um, you should only use a pie chart when you have a true zero point. Um, and there is no true zero here. So one reason the pie charts are so often misused. Bar graphs are used to show comparisons between results, uh, usually categorically. Um, so this would be a better representation of temperatures in certain locations than using a pie chart. Now we can draw comparisons. Histograms look like bar graphs, but show the distribution of scores within a set. In this example, we're looking at the distribution of test scores in a set of 100 scores. And we can see that the scores have been organized into intervals of 10, so 0 to 10, uh, 11 to 20, 21 to 30, and so on. And we can see how many scores there were within that set. So here we have about 13 scores, somewhere between 21 and 30. Another common use of the histogram is in displaying standard deviation, and we'll look at that shortly. A frequency polygon shows change over time or occurrence. So here we can see a comparison of end of year grades in AP Psychology over a three year period. A line graph looks, like, looks similar to a frequency polygon but shows the relationship between variables. In this case, the results in various trials for three different groups, experimental one, two, and the control group. Okay, so data analysis is used to describe an observable phenomenon and to drive meaning from that phenomenon. We can organize and visually represent that data in many ways, but that is not the analysis. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about descriptive and inferential statistics.